Welcome to Shapes of Grief. Liz Gleason here. And this week I'm joined by Tony Lynch all the way in Colorado. Tony, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me on, Liz. It's definitely an honor. Thank you. Some of you may have already listened to our previous chat that Tony and I did um, for Tony's podcast. So I'll share a link to that if anybody wants to listen to that. Um, Tony, thank you so much for that conversation we've just had. And now we're switching the seats and I'm going to interview you. I'm looking forward to it. I'm yeah, definitely too. looking forward to it. Thank you. So Tony, your organization or your podcast is called Memories of Us, Supporting uh -huh. Grieving Men. And you found your purpose after your child died in supporting other men who are grieving. So can we rewind a little bit first, Tony? Yes. Who's your baby? Who's your child? Uh, Jake. Um, he was he was my youngest. Uh, he was the boy. He was the only boy that I have. I had two girls previously, um, but he was born um, December eighteenth, two thousand six. And um, yeah, he was he was my uh, Christmas baby. So it's, it's always just been me and him since he was. Um, there, there's a lot that goes along with that one right there because. There was a time where his mom kept him away from me. Then I got custody of him. And then from the time he was four to the time he passed away, it was always just me and him, you know? So yeah, going to school, having a blast. He was my bubba. He was, he was, he was my, uh, he was my roadie. Yeah. So what happened to Jake, Tony? Um, well, it goes back to when he was overdosed. So that's where it really starts, what happened October 31st, 2015. His uh, pharmacist mixed his medication very, very wrong. Um, and they put my son in the hospital for three days and we wasn't sure if we was gonna make it out of that, which fortunately he did make it out of that. And for the, like, the next nine months, he was a happy, healthy, little little boy you know he was almost nine he had just turned eight um so summertime out with his friends having fun and um june of 2016 um what was it june 13th of 2016 he got sick and uh just didn't know what was wrong and that was um the night before he got sick, because he was sick on a Sunday, Saturday, he was out with his friends playing and swimming and things like that, you know, being a normal child. And uh, Sunday morning, he got sick. And um, he, he just never got better. So we ended up uh, taking him to, to see the family doctor. And um, it was just a whole lot of uh, things that wasn't right. He started peeing blood as a child and things like that. And so we ended up having to go to the hospital, which from the hospital, we had to get airlifted down to another children's hospital. Hmm. And um, they was doing a procedure on him to a blood transfusion, or they was cleaning his blood. So they was, they was recycling. And throughout the process, his blood coagulated so fast that it crushed every organ in his body. Hmm. And that was um, June, June 16th of, 26, of uh, 2016. And so then from there, um, I went through what I would like to call my grieving process, mm -hmm. but there was a lot that I didn't understand. And so what, what ended up happening um, is that I've been through it all. I made some really bad decisions. I lost everything. And I uh, was homeless there for a while. I planned out my suicide. Wow. And I uh, was almost very, very successful. I was almost very, very successful. Um, but something happened. Something happened. Uh, and to this day, I couldn't tell you what happened. It's like a voice just came out of nowhere. And I was in the middle of a desert. I was in the middle of the Utah desert. So there was nobody out there in the middle of the night. And so I figured I'd do it out here. And no one to know, right? Mm. It didn't work that way. And um, 
So you actually were planning your suicide and were trying to execute that when yeah. another alternative appeared or or came through you. Yeah, so something I else. About that. Yeah. Um, so the moment that I was there, um, well, when I finally had everything in play, I managed to open up a weekend to where I knew no one was going to mess with me. So I managed to move people around in my life to be able to do that. So it took me about two and a half months. And so that just goes to show if you want to do something you and you're determined about it, you will do it. And so I planned it out. And um, that weekend I got off work. Uh, that Friday I got off work, had my clothes in my in my vehicle and I took off. So, and I drove out to uh, Utah um, and I spent Saturday fishing, you know, saying bye to my son and asking for forgiveness uh, for what I was going to do. I was already in a dark place. I didn't, I just, I gave up, you know, I, I didn't want to fight anymore. I was done fighting. And um, I remember the next following day, I drove over to the middle of the uh, Utah desert and I was just sitting out there. And I just remembered wanting to cry, but I was so angry. I was so mad at, at life in general. Like, why, why would you do this to me again? I have, I'm alone again, right? And so um, I just said, this is the one thing I can control. And I just remember that, that fear that you should have of dying or, or doing something crazy, it wasn't there. The fear of death just wasn't there. I was just like, I'm done. And I remember sitting there with my gun and um, I was sitting on the outside of the door and I had the door open to my Jeep at the time. And um, I put it, to my, put it to my mouth and I was about to pull the trigger and someone called my name in the middle of nowhere. So automatically, because my thing is, is that I don't want anyone to see, see this. If I'm going to do it, that's the reason why I wanted to be alone. You know, it's easy to be do it when you're alone, but that voice came through just as clear as day and something happened. I ended up throwing a gun into the vehicle and I jumped up and turned on my car lights. And, and there's, again, there was nobody out there, but then there's this, this sense of peace came, came across me and it began to just show me, show me my life. It began to put all of these different things into um, perspective, things that I never really paid attention to, but it was always there. Like you said, it was a lifelong journey, but stepping outside and going from the time I was six years old up until that time where I was about to take my life, it was, you know, everything began to make sense. All my friends I've lost, um, all the family I've lost, the reason why I had to be alone in the journey that I've had to walk. You know, in that moment, sitting sitting there, everything made sense. Mm -hmm. I had an idea of what I was going to do, but I just didn't know what I was totally supposed to do, right? And so from there, um, I drove back to Colorado and I got rid of the gun. And I said, okay, if I'm going to do this, I need help. I need, I need some serious help because if, if I don't, I'm, the next time I do it, the next time I attempt this, I'm going to be very successful. I was this close this time, right? And so um, I began on a journey of trying to, support, trying to find support groups, um, trying to connect with other men and things like that. And I was successful in, in finding those support groups, just none for men. And so, mm. which made it really hard because as a man, I am not going to talk in front of a woman. Well, then I wouldn't because my ego, um, and I never want you to think that I'm weak or that I'm, you know, so-called broken. That's before I learned how to change the words around. And so it became uncomfortable. And for weeks and weeks on end, I fought that desire to ever want to go do the support thing, but I knew there was something else um attached to it 
And mm -hmm. so that began my journey of wanting to fill a gap um, between how or adding in that support for men. I, but most of it was because I wanted to connect with other men like myself because I didn't want to, it was, it was lonely. Yeah. It was very, very it's, lonely. It's amazing, Tony, how so many people who've suffered profound loss are able to alchemize their grief into some sort of life purpose. And it sounds like, you know, that's what you did. But I'm so glad you heard that voice, um, whatever that was, whether it was a voice inside you or something beyond both of us. Um, I'm so glad that happened and that you're here and you're doing what you're doing. And I'd love to just go back to, you know, a couple of things you said. You talked about the anger. I think you mentioned the word violence. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you talked about having, you know, wanting control and, you know, being able to pull a trigger was giving you control over your life. Right. And that's something a lot of bereaved people say is, you know, you've no control over how someone dies or when they die. And we often think that we all assume we're going to outlive our children. Mm -hmm. um, and, to, and when we don't, all of our assumptions about the future are shattered. And, and, and we get this new canvas, you know, how do we navigate this and nothing makes sense. And I think we realize we have so little control in the world. Right. Our assumptive world is, is exploded in that moment. And you said you, you were angry. Could you tell us a little bit about that anger? I mean, you've alluded to it, what you did with that anger. You said you were homeless as well. What did that look like for you, Tony? Because if you went through that, I'm sure somebody else did also. And it's so helpful to share these difficult parts of our story. Right. Um, so that someone who is homeless or in the anger right now or mm -hmm. suffering with rage or feeling out of control can hear themselves or part of themselves in your story. So the anger and violence came from when I was younger. Um, at the age of six, I was molested by my neighbor's son. And it did something to me. And I, I honestly, I put a knife in that man's stomach and I told him, you'll never touch me again. So in a way, I learned how to protect myself before I was even a teenager. And now- With violence. With, with violence, right? Because no one, no one was going to protect me. I knew that, you know, because the more I tried to tell people what was going on, no one wanted to, to believe me. So I looked at it this way, since you're not going to believe me, I know now that I have to know how I have to learn how to protect myself, but I have to learn how to protect my little sister. So I'm gonna have to become something different to keep this from happening because at an early age, I seen the darkness that some people have in them and the damage that they are capable of doing to other people. And so with that being said, is you know, as I began to get older, I began to become more quiet, um, more standoffish, like I had a handful of friends. That were similar to me but on the other side of it i was out picking fights um <laughs> it was it was pretty it was pretty bad i was out picking fights with everybody um stealing from stores those things you know candy and comic books and things like that and but there was a side of me that just i i would fight anyone there was there was no there was no boundary when it came to that and then at an early age, I was being affiliated with the gangs. So now I can carry that mentality with me in a place to where these rules that other people put on me doesn't exist. And I am free to be the valid individual. But now there's other things that play into that. I, I, um, I did martial arts when I was a kid. So that attributed to the violent spells as well. You know, it just made me better at fighting. And I started boxing when I got older and started fighting MMA when I got older than that. So in combination with all of those things, um, that balance streak that I had in me, it began to pile up again, you know, because you can only run from it so much. And my choices put me in situations to where I could. And I get in trouble for it, of course, you know. Um, so when, when I speak of the balance, that stuff was in me before I have my son. 
Now, when I got my son, like you said, I had to take all of these things when my son was born, all of these things um, that had molded me to be the person before him, I had to put off to the side. I had to learn how to control it. And so I thought my life was going to be, I'm going to raise him to be a better man than me. And so I had a vasectomy done because I didn't want any more kids. I didn't want any more. My, he was going to be my last one. I was going to pour everything into him to be better than me, right? To teach him lessons that I wish someone would have taught me, but also to show him, um, to show him what a what a man is supposed to be, right? Not the macho person or anything like that, but the compassionate man, the the responsible individual, the per, the man who's who still believes in chivalry things like that and respect for for the next human being on this planet and my son was beautiful at that he was very very beautiful so now before him i was always alone i've been homeless before him so now i'm in a place i'm in a place where i gotta i can put a key in the door so i that's been my that's been the story of my life so when he passed away um I wanted someone to come and rescue me. There's a side of me that wanted to go out here and despite everybody, just inflict the most violence I could on anybody that I, that I could, but I knew that was wrong. Mm -hmm. And there was a side of me that says, no, you can't do that. But then there's the other side that says, why not? They should feel my pain as well. And so I learned how to, I learned how to, to, to suppress it and kind of work with it a little bit. And, but, then there was a side of me that um, didn't know how to deal with it. So what I mean by making bad decisions, I started online dating and I met a girl, she lived in South Dakota. So this is how I lost everything after all of that. I moved out to South Dakota, found out that it wasn't, wasn't a great fit. Three months later, I had to move back. Now I have no place. I had to get rid of everything that I have. So those bad decisions that came into play and then I became, busy because now I need to distract myself. And so working now, um, building a company and things like that, those are the things that I focused on instead of focusing on what was going on. And then over a period of time, um, it began to manifest itself again. And that's when the suicide planning came out. That's when um, the victim mentality came out and I didn't like that. So I, I wanted other people to be victim, not me. You know, how it's is it? Okay. It's interesting, Tony, that you said you wanted someone to, to mind you, to rescue you. Yeah. You know, there, there's a part of us, I think, when we're that vulnerable, we're very vulnerable after a profound loss. And, and we need tenderness, we need compassion. Mm -hmm. It's like a very small part of, a very young part of us is activated when we experience a loss. And it can be so vulnerable that we do act out in violence yeah. or we want to, other people to suffer. So it's not just me, mm -hmm. but I totally can get how you jumped into dating. I think that's very common. And I think it's quite common amongst men, particularly, mm -hmm. you know, is to, to try and find somebody who will mind me. Right. We might right. can say that consciously to ourselves, but in that desperation for love, and care, we can overlook compatibility and who actually is this person. It's yeah. almost like anybody will do right now until we're then faced with the reality of who they are and who we are together. Right. And that's that's exactly what happened. Um, looking so for your love grief before. caught up with you. Yeah. But it caught up with me a lot sooner than what I thought it was, you know, and I just didn't understand it because, you know, no one ever taught me about grief. No one ever said that, you know, it was okay to have these emotions. I've always been taught to man up. I've always been taught to suck it up, young blood, you know, is everything's going to be okay. Don't cry. So to suppress those emotions and I began and be, I became good at it, but I made, again, made bad decisions. I made really bad decisions. Now, as I'm making these decisions, the whole thing that's now that the reality of this is going on, uh, my world, my, re my reality in my world has changed. 
because now I have to be alone again. And I think that's what the biggest portion was. I didn't want to be alone anymore. I was tired. I was tired of fighting. I was tired of just wandering around, not knowing where my life was going to take me. You know, but most of all, I didn't, I didn't know that this was going to be my purpose. So at that moment, I didn't have a purpose. So, and it's hard for a man without purpose to walk around and pretend that life is okay if we don't have something to shoot for. Mm. And it's, that's what it became. Sounds like a profound lonely experience. Yes. Yeah. And so it was a combination. It was a combination of all of those different things. Um, my biggest trap, my biggest pain became my, my best blessing. It did turn itself into it. I just didn't know what it was going to do because I didn't know I was going to do this, right? We talked about this. I didn't know I was going to do this. You know, I was, I thought I was going to be an artist. Like I said before, I wanted to draw and, and things like that, a, a place where I can be creative, right? Um, and and do, do something that brought me joy. Um, hmm. But that didn't happen that way. You know, and when you I, say you didn't know you were going to do this, you're talking about your grief work supporting yeah. men. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't know I was going to do it, but yeah, it's just something that came about, and I knew it. it like you ever have something uh, grab a hold of you and don't let you go. That's yeah. what it was like. It, that's what it was like. Um, I just remember after the fog, I, and I became anxious, and I started thinking about this thing, and. Um, I, I said, you know, I, I want to be around other men like myself, but where am I going to find them? And, you know, all of these things and something said, let's start a nonprofit. And that's how everything began. <laughs> that's exactly how everything began. And I was like, okay, I'm going to start a nonprofit. How do we start a nonprofit? So I began making phone calls. Hey, I want to start a nonprofit. I'm thinking it's going to be easy. Pay some money, get a, get a 5013C. No, that's not how it worked. That's not how it worked at all. But the whole time while I'm doing this, because I'm trying to figure out, am I going crazy? Because I, now I know what I want to do. I want to do, I want to provide the same, I want to, I want to provide support to these men like myself. But most of all, do um, you ever hear that phrase, um, you have to find your tribe? Of course. So yeah, that's, so that, that's what I was doing. I wanted to find my tribe. I wanted to tr find other men just like myself who have experienced the loss of their parents or their younger brother or, you know, their, their child or any, because I've experienced all of these things. And so these are combinations. So I was like, there has to be more men out here. And I drove myself crazy. Then I told myself, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. It's just too much. I uh, don't want to do it. And something said, yes, you are going to do it. And the next thing you know, um, I was talking with a friend in my garage and I said, you know, this is what I'm going to do. And um, I've been dedicated to doing that since then. And I started this in 2019. And I took me a year and a half to get to where I am today. Um, but it's been, it's been a beautiful journey. The, the grief has been messy, um, but rewarding. The pain is still there, yes, um, but it's it's become my passenger now. You know, it's become it's become my my greatest teacher, my biggest mentor. You know, I know we talked about you know me listening to, but that has been my biggest teacher. Everything I've learned has been inside of me this whole time, and it's just I've just focused on it, mm -hmm. on that book, and reading my story into it, and. Um, staying focused on the things that make sense to me um, in order to serve. So I knew that that's part of who I am now. You know, I am a servant. And so I've been, I've been steadily working on that aspect of it to be better, mm -hmm. more knowledgeable. I like that you say grief is my passenger now. And it's an analogy that I often use with people I'm supporting you know, in the early days or months or even years, it's like grief is driving the bus yes. and we're like in the trunk just being thrown around and we don't know which way it's going to go. But at a certain point, it's like we have to grow the muscles to help us climb over the seats and yeah. get the steering wheel back and go, OK, you can stay here if you must, 
but I'm driving the bus now. Yes. Um, and, and, I, and I like that you say that. Tony, I want to ask you specifically about working with men. Yes. Um, in our chat earlier, you know, we spoke briefly about how men often grieve differently to women mm -hmm. um, or some men grieve differently to some women. We call there's different grieving styles. That's the work of Kenneth Doka. Intuitive grievers tend to be very emotional mm -hmm. and instrumental grievers tend to be problem solvers. Um, and women tend to be emotional and men tend to be problem solvers. But mm -hmm. we know it's not as binary as that. Gender isn't that binary and grief isn't that binary. Most of us are a, a mixture of both, but we tend to have one predominant grieving style. Do you think that's why, you know, you needed to be around men rather than around women? Did you need to find someone who was grieving like you? or who was having similar experiences to you, you know, the suicidal thoughts, the, the, the violence, you know, the wanting to harm people. Were you looking for someone who could explain your experience to you? I was in a lot of ways. Um, and no, it didn't happen that way. It didn't, uh, you, I did end up connecting with a lot of men and uh, opened up the doors. And what ended up happening is that it it gave me a different, a bunch of different perspectives about how men grieve, right? And while there's not a whole lot of information about it, but yes, I wanted to connect with those men um, for the sake of community, right? And connecting and connecting with them. Because for one, I, I didn't know if I was going crazy, right? You know, because I've these thoughts and these feelings are there. Um, but I've never felt them before because I've always suppressed them um, with other things. And so, yes, that's exactly what it was. I wanted to connect with other men. I wanted to be around other men and it turned into something different. And the reason being, because I did go around women and what ended up happening, being a man in a, in a group full of women, you know, a co-ed group full of women, the men become the become the guys that, the women talk to so which doesn't it, you're just piling all of that stuff on top of that man and then we forget that that man is there for the support as well yeah. so and that's the reason why i backed off from going to to the support groups and decided that you know i think it'd be a lot easier just to create us to create a safe space for us men to just come and be men and be able to grieve and talk and um and the reason be, and, and and another reason is is because the stages of grief are look different they look totally different so when i talk about the bad choices and things like that that's that's what my what my grieving process looked like you know it became the addiction to lifting weights and um it became it became more of you know um addressing my mental health and, and things like that, things I had to learn on, on my own, um, understanding where these thoughts of suicide ideation is coming from, you know, why do I feel this way? The depression, right? So the addiction, the bad choices, the homelessness, all of these things, I realized that's what the stages of grief look like. And then I began to notice the similarity with the other men that I was going, that I was talking with. So, um, and then I started talking with women and I noticed that that gap was there, that which you're seeing, you know, you, you, you're wondering why this person is not, this person may not look like that they're asking for help, but they are through the actions that they're, that they're portraying because this is unfamiliar territory for most men, you know, we're not emotional. So, and like you said, we're trying to fix it. So what do we do? We we isolate. We make those bad choices. We do all of those different things. We then it which results in a lot of different, you know, um, situations for men, which only just compounds on top of us. I want to bring in your background here, Tony, because you know you're talking about all the things that compound how you grieve, how you grieve, and you mentioned earlier like quite a violent childhood, and yeah. that. You were assaulted as a young boy 
you mentioned a, a knife and a stabbing with that neighbor. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned a gun. Um, you mentioned gangs, you know, yes. so all of this and, and the life that you were living is going to color and shape the way right. you breathe. Right. Would you speak a little bit about that? Because this is so important. You know, we, we talked about it in our conversation before this for your podcast, mm -hmm. uh, when we're supporting people who grieve, there's so much that we need to take into consideration. Right. socioeconomic status, gender, age, um, skin color, cultural background, um, where we live, um, you know, how grief is, is dealt with in our culture. And I mentioned the work of Dr. Tashel Bordera, mm -hmm. who's done a lot of work looking at suffocated grief, which is the name she's given to young um, black youth, particularly men right. who are treated totally different when they are grieving to to other children um so could you speak a little bit about that tony how you think your background and the violent background and being involved in gangs maybe impacted how you grieve or the support you needed more importantly yes um it did impact it it, it definitely impacted because now you've taken um, years of my life and that have molded me, right? And, and built this, built this sense of security inside of me to where I'm defensive, you know, I'm closed off, I'm isolated and things like that. But it's the, it's the journey of getting there, being in the gangs and things like that. You learn not to trust people because the people that you think are your friends will be the ones that kill you. So you, you constantly have to um, be in a state of survival. And if it wasn't, if it wasn't your friends, it was rival game bangers. And Lord knows we were surrounded by them. So now, you know, you have to take those day-to-day -day things coming in, um, the constant being, a, you have to be aware of the police, things like that, because we was, I mean, being young, black, in a gang, um, living that lifestyle, you have a lot more to look out for than just, you know, your typical, you know, hey, mom, you know, I'm up, I'm going to have dinner and go to school or, you know, have breakfast and go to school. We're going to have a great day, right? No, when we went to school, we had to carry guns. We had to carry guns. We had to have some sort of weapon with us because you never knew what was going to happen, you know? And then if you're walking, say, for instance, you know, you, if you're walking with your family or something like that, you always have to be on the defensive because the next person may not care that you're with your family. So, and it's a different mindset going through it as well. What are you capable of doing? Because this life is going to expose you. It's raw, uncut, and it doesn't care about, it doesn't care about your family. It doesn't care about you. You have one rule, survive. You survive or you die. That's, that, that's how that works, right? Or everything else is made up. There's no rules in there. You, you, have to, you have to use your best judgment. You can't trust anyone. You have to be able to move. You, can, you, you, can't be, um, you can't be held down in one spot because that's how people get killed. You constantly have to move, constantly. And... Be lucky, be really, really lucky, you know? Um, so yes, those things did mold me and um, did a lot of damage because there was the time when I got shot. So I take all of that into that grieving process, right? So that there, there's trauma on top of trauma, on top of, you know, everything else that I learned at an early age that it's so easy when you're, you know, when you're finally, you're older, you're going through these things. You don't want to go back there, but it's so easy to revert back there. It's so yeah. easy to go there because that's what you know. That's exactly trauma. What you, yeah. Trauma imprints in us, doesn't it? You know, and it does. it's exactly what you said. It's layer upon layer of trauma. Um, and then this bereavement is sitting on top of an already vulnerable emotional scaffolding. Mm -hmm. um, it's no wonder that you responded to your loss 
with such a sense of violence and anger? Well, it's triggers, right? It's, yeah. it's triggers because most, most men that go through these things, um, we don't pay attention to the past because we're still trying to figure out where we're going, where our next step is going to be. And so now you take all of these things and you compile it in there, you know, you can walk past someone um, and they say something to you, you take it totally out of, out of context. And so that can be a trigger, which will actually, you know what I'm saying, send you right back into a place to where I have to defend myself again, because now we don't understand the language. Right. You know what I'm saying? As we talked before, we don't understand the language. We don't understand that it's okay to hurt. It's okay not to be okay. Right. And so instead of not being okay with being okay, I have to fix it. And if I have to fix it by hurting you, then I am. That's that's yeah. the way the mind works in, in times like that. Like, or or you retreat. There's been times where I isolated myself for months and months on end um, because I didn't want to be bothered. I knew how to push my phone over. I knew how to do this, that, another. But now being alone is a dangerous place as well because that's when your mind goes and starts to play on you. You know, yeah. all of these different things. So I had to think about um, my past, all the things I've done. That guilt is there now that I'm here. That I pay, that I pay for the things that I've done by losing my son, losing everybody I've cared about and things like that. Is this the reason why I'm alone? You know, mm. like... And then you try to figure out, then you try to figure out, am I really a bad person? But because once you lose a child, that's exactly, am I really a bad person? What did I do wrong? Right? Yeah. What could I could have done differently to protect him or her? Right? And so all of these different things play in there. And then automatically your mind switches over and go, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't. And you make your mind up, you know, and that fear isn't there. Some people will run from it. Some people will run into it. I'm, I'm actually glad I ran into it because it changed me. It changed me in, in a lot of different ways, right? It gave me more compassion, more knowledge, more um, dedication, not just to the people, that, not just to the men that I serve, but to myself, because it made me reflect on myself and actually understand um, my healing process and understood that, you know, um, after, after that relationship, I knew that I wasn't in a great place to be in a relationship. So I didn't want it. I didn't want to put someone else through there because in the back of my head, it was going, Hey, you're hurting. You're going to hurt someone else. You can't keep doing this to people because it's not good. So I've taken some years and just focused on that, focused on the healing and um, being better. It sounds like you were really stuck between a rock and a hard place where when you were out in community and amongst people, you just found it hard to trust yourself and, you know, control those violent thoughts or impulses. But yet while you were alone, it was that mind, your own self, your loneliness and, and where our mind can go. And it's like, where do I go from here? Okay, into relationship. Maybe if I try that and we're all looking for that door that will have some answers, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And it sounds like eventually you had to just sit there until you had this parachute out, okay? Do something. If you can't find the solution for the situation you find yourself in, which is a man grieving the death of his child and not finding the proper support, create it, make it happen. Right. You know, and that is what finally gave you purpose. Um, just before I go on to your work, Tony, I want to pick up on something else you said, which was about control and guilt and, you know, the way you questioned yourself, was it my fault he died? Could I have done something different? And I hear this so much from bereaved parents mm -hmm. and it's almost like it's easier to take the blame than just live with the chaos of life that people can die and do die Mm -hmm. Most parents choose to say it was my fault or maybe I could have done something differently. Unconsciously, they do this, but it's almost like it gives them a little bit of relief to think maybe they had some part in it because then there's a bit of control in the chaos of life and death and the randomness that sometimes happens. 
in, in some ways, yes. Um, but there's a whole nother side to it. Most most parents um, say that after they um, realize that there is nobody else to blame. So in the beginning, when these things happen, their initial shock is, what did you do? Yeah. What, what did you do? Right. And blame so, someone else. Right. Right. You want to blame because you want somebody to be responsible. Yeah. And, and, and then sometimes you in a situation where you realize that there's nobody to blame. Like in my situation, my son's death was ruled unknown. So I can't point the finger and said, this person did this and this person did that. This would be just a whole lot of speculation. You know, I could say, oh, the, his pharmacist did it because she mixed his medication wrong. And, you know, that's what caused his overdose and, and things like that. And that's what caused him to die. It wasn't, there was nothing in the system. No one could explain it. So his death was ruled unknown. So I also take that into effect as well. I have an open wound. I have a wound that will never close. The not knowing, Tony. The not knowing, you know, and I have to. I have to accept that reality, right? And so even today, yes, it's it sucks. It sucks because I do have to accept the reality that there's no one to blame, but also there's no reason why he passed away. There's no, there's no results on it. And so I take that um, and I allow myself to um, surrender in my grief in that area. That's why I say my grief is a passenger with me, right? Mm -hmm. you know, um, because it's there. It's the only thing that I have left of the memories. You know, that's where I store my memories at. And I've learned how to protect it. But also during the process, why, uh, why it became hard to um, have people around me because of their expectations. but also um also had a girlfriend at the time and her words to me aren't you over it because this was six months after my son passed away and she goes aren't you over it so right then and there this person's supposed to care about me right you know and, and things like that and her words hurt me deeper than anything else and so i learned um i learned to keep my mouth shut i learned not to take things personally, you know, because they don't understand. I'm glad that they don't understand, but also I had to learn how to tuck that anger away because most, sometimes when people say stuff like that to you, the first thing you want to do is punch them in the mouth. And uh, so I went, I'm done hurting people. I will hurt myself before I hurt someone else. And so that's where that mind, my mind used to take me from time to time. Um, but also, you know, um, it's it was in it was in me to protect myself to um, preserve what I have left to protect the memory so can, no one can use it use it against me right you know um, so yeah there was it was definitely a lot of that. There's so much in what you've said, and I'm sure that so many people listening will find part of their story you know, in, in what you've shared today, Tony, certainly around the violence and the questioning. And, you know, these are these are things that often aren't spoken about. Right. Um, and, and it's a gift that you are you're so open and sharing all these pieces of you and your journey, both before Jake died, before Jake was born right. um, during Jake's life and, and after his death. And you've alchemized your grief. I mean, I hear you say it's still an open wound, of course. Um, but you, you're not stuck between that rock and that hard place. You found some way to make life manageable and to make the suffering a little bit easier for yourself. Mm -hmm. What does your work do for you now? What, what, what sort of sense of self have you gained from, from what you're doing? I found my smile. I found me, right? The true me what I'm called to do. So my work gives me purpose. Um, it gives me an outlet to be creative and to teach others to give tools, the tools that I've learned, but also to connect um, with these men 
and connect these men with other resources that may be better for them as well. So my that's what my work has done for me is has been a a blessing. Um, and it's been hard, it's, but it's been worth it. You know, I can get up every day and I smile and um, I, can, I, can, I can accept my day a lot more knowing that, that in those moments, I can be available to the next person so they don't have to suffer the way that I did, right? Mm. And to be able to walk with those men fills me with gratitude because I get to watch these men change, not really change, but become who they are after those losses, right? To become better men, open men, being, being able to talk to their family and friends and being able to be there for the children that they do have and, and you know, but to be there for themselves, to understand that it's okay to, it's okay to put your hand up and say, I need to go sit down somewhere. I need to I need to be by myself for a little bit if that's okay, and not be ashamed of or of um, how they feel. But also, they love being heard, you know, and that's what I want to provide for them is that space so they can be validated and heard and be supported and uplifted, you know. And and it's nothing more beautiful when you're around a bunch of men and they speak life over each mm -hmm. other. Right. And they and they not ashamed of getting up and grabbing the next man that's in tears and just holding him. And just being in that moment with those with those individuals, that's what it's, it's brought me a blessing that I never thought that I could ever have. And so, yeah, and I, like I said, I've been dedicated to that since then, you know, but understanding myself as well, because the healing process, it has to come from these different areas. You have to be around other people, uh, uh, men and women like yourself, because that's where your your connective is going to come from. Because out of those groups and and all out of all of those people, you're going to find a handful of people that you're going to connect with on a different level, and those are going to be your grief companions as you begin to grow and move through with your grief. Because you can never move through it; you have to move with it. Because if you try to move through it, it'll block you off. It's never ending. Like you said, there's no time limit on it, you know, but to have that patience, um, that's what it's about. It's, mm -hmm. That's what it's about. It's about seeing our communities heal, the men and women and our children heal and be better, but also to provide that support. It's so lovely, Tony, and just the way you describe that, it reminds me of a quote by Parker Palmer. Um, mm. And it's something like the human soul doesn't want to be advised, fixed or saved. The human soul just wants to be witnessed and companioned exactly as it is. And it sounds like you're doing that intuitively and beautifully. Um, yeah, it sounds like you're a gift to the men who are finding you, Tony. My last question, yes. what are your hopes for your future self? For Having myself. been through all these things that you've been through in your life, including the death of your son, which was not your first loss by the sound of things, mm -hmm. what do you hope for your future self? For myself, I want to I want to live and have the best human experience that I can possibly have um, to grow more spiritually and understand myself in this world and this gift that I carry along with me. To um, to leave a legacy behind, so that when I do leave this place, I'm not you know, forgotten that what I leave behind is going to inspire the next generation to do better than me, right? You know, um, so th that's that's my goal. I want to set the bar high in, in what I do and helping and helping men heal, but also connecting, you know, connecting with other people as I go. I want to be known. I want to build, I want to build something that cannot be torn down overnight. 
but it but it can be built upon over generations. Because I know the next generation, if I put the bar high enough, they're going to be a lot smarter than me. And they're going to, they're going to come back and go, that's what he did? And, oh, yeah. And I want them to shoot for it. I want them to know that it's possible to, to heal and um, have a fulfilled life um, through, through the trauma and tragedies that we go through. So, and, th and that's the biggest thing. I want to inspire people to, um, to be better human beings, but also it's to almost, heal. It's almost like your healing came through being of service. Yes. And I love the way you describe that, Tony, because earlier when you were talking about Jake and when he came to live with you, your goal was to help make him, I think your words were a better person than you were, yes. or just to make things easier for him that life would be better for him than it was for you. And now in Jake's legacy, you're taking grief and the grieving experience and you're saying, I want my work to make it easier for the people coming behind me. Right. Um, so, so there's a, a lovely full circle there. It is. And Tony, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's, I, loved, I love this. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's been wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for sharing young Tony and your experiences and your son, Jake, yeah. and, and your experience of going through the grieving process and what that was like for you. Um, I really appreciate the insight you've given me and the listeners into what grief was like for you. Um, and as always, somebody somewhere will hear part of their experience and, and gain some hope and inspiration from your story. And that is, um, yeah, that's priceless. It is. Thank you, Tony Lynch. So people can find you, Memories of Us, Supporting Grieving Men. What's your website, Tony? It's uh, www.memoriesofus.org. Um, and they can also check out the Memories of Us podcast, and we're about to start season five. So they're gonna see all kinds of great, new great interviews with inspiring people, you know, so they can also take something away from there. But also they can also check out my new podcast as well, which is called Grief Let's Talk About It, which is a live panel discussion. And we do that twice a month, um, bi-weekly, and we take topics and we dive deep into them. So it's very educational and it's, um, we answer your questions. If you have questions, we answer those questions in real time for you. Great. Sounds like an incredible service you're offering. Um, and if you send me the links to both of those, mm -hmm. I will share them with the podcast description for this episode. And like I mentioned earlier, Tony and I actually spoke before this recording where Tony interviewed me for his podcast. So yeah, if you're interested true. in listening to that, drop over to... Um, to Tony's podcast on the link in the description of the podcast. Okay, Tony, have a lovely day. It's evening time here for me. So I'm about to go make dinner for four hungry kids. All and right. I think you're off to do your laundry. Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to go do that. <laughs> it was well worth it. The laundry can wait. Uh, after <laughs> the ecstasy, the laundry. <laughs> yeah, my laundry can wait. I can go over there and grab it real quick. It's not a problem. <laughs> yeah Tony thank you so much for the valuable conversation and I know we're going to meet again so I look forward to this new collegial relationship that we've started yes we got a lot of stuff great stuff coming on and would love to have you have you be a part of it oh and also before we get off um, I just want to remind people as well is that we do have the global grief conference coming up in April of 2023 this year in just a few more months and it's going to be fantastic. We're going to have grief podcasters. We're going to have workshops. We're going to have guest speakers from across the world. And it's free for anybody to attend. So you got to stay tuned for that as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Tony. You're welcome.